Welcome to Digital Asset News, the top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets and break it down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we've got some really interesting stuff. First up, Pompliano podcast had on Jim Kramer from Mad Money, and it was an hour-long podcast. It was really fascinating, but what I did is I broke it down into five sections, which was the crux of the most important parts and why I believe Jim Kramer is not only going to be a bull for Bitcoin, he's going to be the new Bitcoin Jesus. Also, MicroStrategy, which was in the news about a month ago, who had already bought 21,000 Bitcoin is back at it again and they just purchased 16,800 Bitcoin. So the question is, did MicroStrategy use its competitive advantage for all its data analytics and that's why they bought Bitcoin or is there some other reason? Finally, we're going to go over top analyst says one altcoin massively undervalued, goes long on Bitcoin and talks about three crypto assets and why these types of stories and all in the future I am completely jaded to and I do not believe any of them. And that'll roll us into Q of the day, which will go over the very last part. But first, let's take a look at what's going on in the market. So today it is Tuesday, 15th of September. It's about 10 a.m. in Texas time. Looks pretty good. So what's going on? Bitcoin is up 0.8% and it's teetering on 10.7, 10.8, somewhere around the 11K range. And that, I got to tell you, makes me pretty excited. What is not exciting is if there's a little drop down from 378 now to 365. I was kind of hoping it would break that $4 barrier, but hey, here we are. Tether's tether, nobody cares. XRP is at whopping 24 cents. Watch out. Polkadot, number five position at a market cap of 4.8 billion. Let's see if it can hold that or if it's going to keep flipping with Chainlink and or Bitcash, which has a potential hard fork coming up in November. We'll see how that goes. And if you haven't seen the Roger Veer interview that we did last week, it's a pretty good indicator of what's going to happen as far as that hard fork. So check that out. That was on Labor Day. Also, what's down massively is Binance coin, ouchie, 15%. And this was after the news that Binance was going to get into DeFi. Looks like it may not be working too well for them. I don't know. 26% down for the seven day average, but there was a really fascinating video uh, done by Satoshi Stacker. And I give my hats off to that gentleman for actually going in there and mixing up in the whole DeFi space. And he did a lot of different DeFi. He really invested a lot of money and he just pretty much breaks it down about how much he gained, really how much he lost over, over the whole time. So uh, if you haven't uh, checked it out, I'll link at the very end, but it was a fascinating one. And I gotta tell you, DeFi I think has its place, but um, <laughs> Just be careful. That's all I'm going to say. Crypto.com only up 0.7% after they also announced DeFi. So there we are. And then, of course, uh, the other news was Coinbase had listed Wi-Fi and UMA because, hey, if Coinbase and Crypto.com are doing it, you better believe Coinbase is going to jump in because it doesn't matter all the great products that are out there and how much, how long they've been waiting. They're just like, you know what? Forget you. We're just going to go for these, these DeFi projects because that's what we do. I'm not mad at them, but... Uh, yeah, actually I am. Litecoin, Bitcoin SV, Cardano, uh, down 2.7. EOS, looks like everything's down across the board. Let's see what else is. Wow, 12% for Aave or Aave. And it looks like Urine Finance is uh, right around 40,000. So not nothing really too big. Wow, it's 12% down for synthetics. Oof. Zero uh, percent. Uh, nothing really too big. All right. Although there is one that I always pass over and I really shouldn't. Theta Network is down two percent, but it's still above 50 cents. I just got my stream key from Theta and I'm excited because I'll be doing live streams over there. If you don't know, Theta is one of my top 10 holds. It's, uh, you know, I'm a very conservative person on this channel, but uh, I think Theta is going to be huge. And I need to do a whole video about that. But if you haven't checked out Theta, definitely do that today. All right, let's jump up in today's top stories. So first up, this was a great interview. It just was. And this is one of those things that uh, Pompliano can do that I just cannot do. And he has been in the traditional finance sector. And now he is in the cryptocurrency digital asset. And uh, he's smart. He's smart. He asked the great questions. And he has uh, a great way of educating people in a simplistic uh, terms. And that's what's needed for Jim. Jim here. If you haven't seen the show, it's just him pounding on the table <laughs> and just talking about all these different stocks. Some people hate them. Some people like them. I mean, I I personally like to watch a show every so often. You got a lot of energy. This this guy's got more energy than my grandson, which is amazing. So, um, but but the big thing is that he is the typical boomer, right? He's the guy that's like, I invest in stocks, I invest in bonds, I invest in gold. So cryptocurrency is dumb. But when he's on Pompliano's podcast, I think the reason that he was is because there's been so much information coming out, especially about 
these uh, institutions like Fidelity Digital Assets with 8 trillion assets under management. We're going to talk about that later and how they were in the traditional game. Now they bridged over to digital assets and what that means. Also, TD Ameritrade, 1 trillion assets under management. They're also in cryptocurrency. And the legend Paul Tudor Jones with his 21 billion assets under management, uh, which is paltry, 21 billion. Pfft. Anyhow, he's got 2% of, 1 to 2% of total investments in a Bitcoin futures. To be clear, that's what he said. And uh, uh, I mean, I knew this would pay off because you have all these traditional players and there's a lot more. I'm not going to go over all of them. But if you have these big players in the traditional space, that's going to leak over into a guy like Jim Cramer, who's going to talk to all his people on a nationally televised show and probably talk to them about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and just a big flywheel. It's just going to keep going and going and going. I knew this would be big. It just would take time. I didn't think it would be this fast, but hey, here we are. So i like to see this type of thing, and it was a great interview, and I listened to the whole hour and seven minutes, but uh, I broke it down into really five parts. The first, like, 25 minutes is just Jim talking about Jim, which is it's interesting. You know, Harvard guy, he, he went through everything, and uh, pretty smart in how he built his businesses and whatnot. Great. But to get to the real crux of it, it's just these five parts, and it's really from 49 minutes to 55 minutes. And this is where I think is the meat and potatoes of the whole thing. So the first part here... I'm just going to lay it all out to you. This is why Kramer absolutely will buy Bitcoin. And it's all about the Fidelity connection, his kids. And we're going to talk about why Bitcoin's going to explode in under two minutes. Let's take a listen. In there and some gold that I, they may look back and say, why? What was my father thinking? What, why didn't he know about this? He was supposed to be such a savvy guy. And I think the answer is because I'm scared. But, you know, I need, I like this idea that the community is behind you. I like the fact that um, this Gemini is somebody you trust. And I, I have to do my work, obviously, with the others. You know what, of course, would be the easiest is like if, you know, if J.P. Morgan, uh, which I have, I just told J.P. Morgan, listen, I want to buy some Bitcoin, but they I, I, they won't do it. I don't think. So J.P. Morgan hasn't done it yet. I'm sure they will at some point. But Fidelity has a I very- I don't even Fidelity. All right, so Fidelity has a very big uh, digital asset business, and uh, one of the things that they're doing is basically helping a bunch of their clients get into Bitcoin, right? So whether they can help me, uh, I think so. Yeah, they they can basically they can. I help. have most of my money in Fidelity. Oh, then there you go. Yeah, they can absolutely help. I'll oh, when we get done. I'll introduce you to uh, to somebody over there who can uh, who can help you do it. Well, that would be great. I mean, I, look, I we got a little sidetracked here, but the reason I want to stay with this education, I that's what I'm about. I'm a faux educator if I don't know Bitcoin. You know, for a long time, people say, well, how about Bitcoin? And I say, well, look, I don't trade uh, coffee, and I don't trade cotton, and I don't trade Bitcoin. And that sufficed for a very long time. Uh, it, it worked until the $3 trillion package, because we don't have that. We don't have $3 trillion in this country. You can raise the, you make the rich pay as much as you want. This is the first time in my life, and I've said it publicly, that I know we don't have the money. And, and i that's one of the reasons why I like gold so much. But like you said, how about upside? Okay, so a lot to break down there. But it really comes down to three things. First of all, in the very beginning, Kramer said, I'm an idiot. I don't know these things. And you just have to be an idiot in the beginning because you don't know anything. I, I appreciate someone who actually comes out and goes, you know what? I just don't know. And it's so rare these days for people to do two things. One, admit they're ignorant. And two, admit they're wrong. It seems like it never happens. Like me, I'm a moron. I do a ton of mistakes. Like I said, I always ask my wife. She'll tell you. And I don't know a lot of things. And there's things that I have to research. And that's just how it is. So it's refreshing when Jim, who is, you know, one of the staples of the financial industry, I mean, just because of where he's at and people know him and everything else, it's just refreshing to hear. That's the first thing. The second thing is I know he's going to buy Bitcoin because he talks about his kids. He's super worried about his kids. And he's like, you know what? And he talks about how gold, his dad taught him about gold. My family taught me about gold. It's the same type of thing. But he said, you know what? There are certain disadvantages to it. He goes, you know, you have to pay for it to, to be put into under lock and storage. It's very heavy to move around. It's very expensive to move around. And then he goes, he said something I'd never heard before. He said, you know what? And then for my kids to uncover where it actually is, even though I put in a will and I put in a trust and everything else, gold gets lost sometimes. He goes, it's not uncommon for that to happen. Since 
I wasn't born in a very rich family. Uh, we don't have gold to hold down. So maybe that does happen in the rich. So, you know, some pieces get gets lost and whatnot. But I thought it was interesting how he said that. So that's the first thing. And then the, the second thing was, you know, about fidelity. So we're going to talk about fidelity. He's already got his money there and they already have digital assets, which we just talked about. So why wouldn't he get into it? It's going to happen. And I think he's going to be talking about it on the show. And the third thing he talked about was he goes, listen, we don't have the money. Three trillion assets in our man. I mean, three trillion uh, that we just print out of thin air. He goes, we don't have it. That's America's problem right now. And this goes to an article that just came out today. And it talks about a macroeconomic trend boosts Bitcoin and gold. And I'm not going to go over it in detail. But it pretty much just talks about the same thing we've been saying on this channel for a long time. All this quantitative easing and the unrest, politic, not politically, but globally, and all the different things that are happening as far as the uncertainty that's going to happen. One, U.S. presidential election. Two, small businesses are getting wiped out. GDP is down to the, I mean, to the ground. And then we have all these things with the coronavirus happening. There's so much uncertainty going on. And let's not even mention what I just said, $3 trillion that is just being printed via quantitative easing. You have all that uncertainty. People need some type of stability. And guess where it's going to come from? cryptocurrency digital assets which is one of sometimes one of the most volatile uh, assets that are out there they're going to be shifting into something that people like jim kramer can actually get into go you know what uh you can't print more bitcoin and uh of course i'm going to keep up with gold gold will do fine i like gold but i think that dram here is like you know what i see what's going on i see the writing on the wall i'm gonna get into bitcoin and that's exactly why Bitcoin will explode and all the other digital assets behind it will explode. And that's just how it is. I mean, I can't put it out any more simple than that. Okay, the next part I want to talk about, and it's only like 40 seconds, 50 seconds, it's less than a minute. And it really drives home the point to everybody you're going to talk to about people who still believe in saving. I remember when I was growing up, uh, my mother would always tell me, if you want to get ahead in life, you have to save your money and put it in a, in a savings account and you'll be okay, which is, I'm sure, like what a lot of people have heard uh, that are listening to this channel. Maybe you yourself have heard the same thing, but I, I need to have you hear this because it's super important when you're talking to those people, what you're going to uh, when you start talking to them about cryptocurrency digital assets, people in your family, your friends, your loved ones, and they're like, wanting to save some money. Well, this is why. The best thing that you're going to see, and you've probably seen this chart before, is uh, if you go back to 1971 and you uh, take the U.S. stock market denominated in dollars, it's like a perfect line up at 45 degree angle to the right, right? It just looks like great compounding growth. Yes. If you denominate the same exact stock market in gold, it's down, right? So the stock market's down denominated in gold. I it's know. just that the dollar's being devalued, which again, I mean, oh. that... So first of all, look at Jim's face. He knows all these things. He's been in the game. He knows exactly what it is. So when you take a look at him, you're like, well, that's exactly how I would feel too, especially when I realize that the dollar is going to go down anyhow. And let me be clear. I'm not saying to never save money. We all need cash in our bank accounts for those rainy days or for health issues or for layoffs or for whatever else that comes up. I'm not saying to get rid of all money. That's ridiculous. What I am saying is, is that when you're trying to like talk to people who are about, you know, I just got to save and put money in, you're losing money by putting in the bank. And this is why. That is what is happening. And the bottom 50% that are uneducated about this stuff, right? They're the ones who get hurt the most because they live paycheck to paycheck. They just have cash yeah. sitting in their accounts, all stuff. But- for those that can educate themselves, you got to get into these inflation hedge assets, right? And so gold is going to be just fine. Like it's not a gold's going to do bad. It's just that Bitcoin is going to be way more volatile and over very long periods of time. So this is the same thing we talked about yesterday for an asymmetrical investment. And that is exactly what Bitcoin is. So I'm not sure what chart Pompliano here is talking about as far as gold and dollar and whatnot, as far as like the stock market. But I did find this fantastic image, which shows the purchasing power of stocks like the S&P 500, the purchasing power of gold and the purchasing power of uh, fiat money all the way going back all the way to 1926. So if you take a look at, uh, of course, the gold part here is the gold. Uh, this purple line is the purchasing power of fiat money. And this is the purchasing power of the S&P 500 or stocks. And of course, you can see that stocks have gone up. Uh, that is not debatable. I believe that is the truth. However, gold has also gone up mightily. I mean, pretty well, not mightily, I would say, because I mean, look at the SP. And of course, the purchasing power of fiat money has just drastically dropped off the face of the earth. And that is the whole thing, especially on top of that with inflation, which is 2% per year. So again, for savers, you have to, it's not about 
how much money you're accumulating. It is the purchasing power of what you have. And when you can take a look at these types of graphs, it really just hits home like, holy smokes, I might be in the wrong thing. The last two parts take a minute and a half. And this one just drove home. I had to include it. It, it. it was just bothering me. I just didn't understand why some people would get into grayscale with all the premium. I remember back in, in the day, I mean, Ethereum had, had like a 5X premium just to get in. I'm like, why would anybody do that? Why would they go to grayscale and purchase all these things? They can just go to any exchange and do it themselves. Well, this is why. You're the most conservative person in the world. You can literally go buy GBTC. Now, GBTC is that ticker that just yeah. has the Bitcoin exposure. There's some premium to it, right? What I would tell people is if you're an accredited investor, you can actually go and participate in the uh, private placement of GBTC. So you can go to Grayscale and say, hey, I don't want to buy this stock publicly. I want to invest in the private placement. You got to hold it for six months illiquid, right? But at the end of six months, you still have the same price risk of Bitcoin, but now you capture the premium rather than pay for the premium. Oh, okay. So there's a little bit of premium think arbitrage. Just owning it outright is for... Well, owning it outright, I think, is the best thing to do. Yes, right? I, I think that if I'm going to go in... Here's what I'm thinking. I, I immediately get comfort with that grace. Why do I get comfort? It's a stock. Stock, of course. What? Because it's a stock. And that's the whole thing. I always forget this part. And this is one of my problems is that I always just assume people are like me or like, or, or like you and me. Like we just, we get into the space, we can see the future. It just makes sense. And we're going to go to an exchange. We're going to hold it. We're going to put our nano ledger. No big deal. What's the problem? Why can't everybody do that? I mean, I don't even think why people don't do that because I think they'll just do that. And now I look at Jim, I'm like, oh, that's it. And this is like that, that head slapping moment where like, Rob, remember, not everybody's like you. And not everybody's like you watching this video. People have their different levels of comfort and there's different levels of what they can get into. So some people like uh, Grayscale, I'm like, cool. Some people are just like, hey, I just want to do the exchange and have them custody it, cool. And some people want to do Nano Ledger because they want to own everything, not your keys, not your crypto and all that stuff, right? So now it makes crystal clear sense. And the last thing I want to bring up is about dollar cost averaging. You know, on this channel, I'm not big on to DeFi uh, as far as like yield farming and jumping from place to place, putting money into all these different projects, whatever else. I have a plan and the plan is just to be an investor. And one of those things that comes along with that is dollar cost averaging. And Pompliano brings it right home with a fantastic point about dollar cost averaging from the highest to the lows. Let's take a listen. Yeah, it, it does. And the other thing you were talking about was basically dollar cost averaging. So here's a crazy yeah. stat for you, which is uh, in December of 2017, Bitcoin hit twenty thousand dollars. Right. It, it fell from eighteen until today. It's now around eleven thousand dollars. Let's call it. But if you dollar cost averaged every single month the same amount of money from the high all the way till today, you would be up double digit percentages on your investment. Okay, well, that's how I do things. I mean, I tend to either do it when I was used to be able to be much, you know, more active. I would do it every month. I'd invest every month. And then if the market fell between 10 and 15, I would double up that month, okay? So there, perfect example of why a dollar cost average. But there's another example that I didn't play, which was earlier in, which Jim was talking about his friends who you know always hit him up for advice, which makes sense. And he just says, hey, don't go all in. You know, dollar cost average in, you know, well, essentially what he said is, you know, put a little bit in and then in a week or a month or whatever else, put another in, another in. Because what I want you to do is when the price drops, which it will drop, what I want you to be able to do is not say, oh, it dropped, I have to sell. When it drops, you have enough money to say, oh, I need to buy. And that's the big thing about when I talk about dollar cost averaging and not FOMOing in. Because when you put everything in and you go, wow, I just lost 20%, it's it's nerve wracking. And if, you, if you're not used to it and you don't have strong hands, then you pull your money out and you lose. And not everybody is like you who are here right now. Now you listening, you may be early or you may have been like an investor for like 10 years. I don't know. But that's why I'm always preaching about don't go all in because I don't know who you are. And I want to just make sure that you are safe and you're set up. And when things start to drop, you're not like, I got to pull my money out and you lose out and you're, and you're out of this game. I want you to stay in because I know you're going to make big gains. And I know if things drop, you have the money to put more in, just like what Kramer said. And I'm going to actually implement that in my strategy. If it drops 10, uh, 10 to 15%, I'm going to double up. All right, so that's really it. I'm going to link this in the description. You can watch the whole thing if you want to. It's fascinating. It's really good. I recommend jumping past 25 minute mark because it's all Jim Kramer, and then just go with the, the rest of the stuff. So let me know what you think in the comment section. Let's move on. Next up, and I'll make this quick, uh, MicroStrategy buys another 16,800 Bitcoin. <laughs> That's a lot of money. What's going on? So on September 14th, yesterday, 
MicroStrategy completed its acquisition of 16,796 Bitcoins as an aggregate price of 175 million. Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy said in a tweet, I gotta tell you, uh, CEOs love to tweet. You know, nothing else to do, I guess. He says, to date, we have purchased a total of 38,000 Bitcoins at a price of 425 million almost half a billion good for them inclusive of fees and expenses in 2012 sailor wrote about the mobile wave which discussed the impact mobile computing had on business and politics and before i go on if you don't know um micro strategy it is an analytics platform a lot of computerized learning and they bought 21,000 bitcoin in august they now own 0.1 percent of all bitcoin maybe now it's 0.2 percent and the CEO stated, hey, Bitcoin is uh, digital gold, harder, stronger, faster, and smarter than any money that has preceded it. So my question always is, if they're into analytics and computerized learning, did they just use all the uh, information at their disposal? Hey, the next big thing is Bitcoin and we need to jump onto it, which would make sense because that's exactly what it is. Anyhow, so Sailor's really, he's ahead of the curve. He talks about the mobile wave. And then the firm reportedly pivoted to what was described as the virtual wave, which involved the rapid dematerialization of products, services, and processes enabled by advances in technologies and catalyzed by the COVID crisis, which we see right now with Zoom. Um, you know, technology is taking over. I mean, it's already been taken over, but with, with the coronavirus and everything else, uh, it's become crystal clear that, hey, we don't need to go to an expensive office in a business building. We can just meet virtually on Zoom or Blackboard or whatever else is out there, or Teams, and we can collaborate. We don't have to have all this overhead. It makes sense. And when he talks about uh, the mobile wave, I remember as when I was doing digital marketing back in 2012, same things I do now <laughs> with my other business. Businesses, but uh, I remember the big switch from desktop uh, and tablets to mobile. Everything that we used to design was for uh, computerized or for for um, desktops, but uh, now everything we des we design is all for mobile. I mean, we, there's a ton of analytics and data out there that uh, all the different things that people actually buy are on their mobile phone. And this guy was ahead of the curve back then. I think he's ahead of the curve right now buying Bitcoin, but it only makes sense. However. He hasn't felt this way. In 2013, he tweeted, Bitcoin's days are numbered, which is quite a change of tune. And that's the whole thing. You're going to see people, friends, family, loved ones, people out there in, in the wild. They're going to say, you know what, Bitcoin, it, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's just dead. It's, it doesn't work. It's, you know, and uh, they're all going to come around. And that's what's going to happen. So uh, I envy you. If you are coming in right now, because we're in a down market, a little—I mean, we're we're in a little bit of a bull market. We're, we're but we're not parabolic like 2017 December. So I envy you if you're here right now. I think it's the perfect time to really start investing. So congratulations. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Last up, top analyst says one altcoin massively undervalued goes long on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and three crypto assets, and why I think this is all a bunch of BS. So uh, this is from the Crypto Dog. Nothing against him, uh, not at all. But I just, I've been a little jaded uh, since I've been in this uh, in this game for a while. And so Crypto Dog talks about, built a cream position recently. I think this is a massively undervalued, sitting at 100 billion, million market cap, and blah, blah, blah. And he starts to talk about uh, Wi-Fi and some other things, whatever else. I, I don't really care. Um, what it really comes down to, and I'm going to make this crystal clear. Let's just jump into the office for the Q of the day. All right, everybody, welcome back to the office. So I wanted to uh, kind of explain my position as far as that last article that we just looked at. So uh, nothing against uh, the analyst who was featured in that article. I, uh, I'm sure he's got you know a great profile and everything else. But the, the thing is that you have to understand with this entire market, with any market, with, with anything that's out there, is that uh, people are going to be biased. And even me, I am biased myself. Like, I mean, I have uh, heavy positions in Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Chainlink, Cardano, XRP, Tezos, Theta, and the list goes on, EOS. So when I talk about these things, it's not because I'm not trying to be biased. I'm, I'm trying not to be, but there's always going to be something in my head, always, that says, talk about these things, talk about these things. So when we hear these analysts claim, you know, oh, you know, I got this huge position, you have to always take a step back and go, what's the real motive? Is it because they believe in the technology, they think it's going to change the world, they think it's a good project, or is it because they're just trying to pump their bags? Now, there are levels of uh, nefariousness, right? Some people are like the worst, the worst. And they just talk about a project just because they got paid to talk about a project and in the back of their head or even in the, in the, in the forefront, it's like, this is trash. I don't really care. But I'm just trying to, uh, you know, put it out to you suckers. And then there's other people who, you know, 
are like, hey, I invested into this. I totally um, believe that this is going to be a very big thing. And uh, I'm just going to talk about it because I think it's going to be awesome. Now, I'm the same way with a lot of my positions. Also, uh, for Celsius and Voyager, uh, I talk about them a lot because my, my one-two punch. And I totally believe in what they're trying to do. And I am behind them. So there is that part. And um, I didn't really want to get into it, but uh, I, I probably should. And, and that is that there was a there was a, a live stream I was doing. Actually, well, no, it was a premiere. And we were talking about a specific um, cryptocurrency. And I won't give you the name, but I own it. And uh, I'm just too stubborn to give it away. Anyhow, uh, we were talking. Uh, there was somebody who was just you know talking about how great it is and this and that. And he was he or she was downplaying and poo-pooing on everybody else's project, which I got to tell you, nothing uh, infuriates me more. Like people talk about, oh, all these comments don't, don't make me angry or whatever else. Well, there's some that do make me angry, and it's when people will leg talk about a project, and if they believe it or not, I, I can never tell, but they're like, oh, this is a scam, and this is awful, and this is, you know, it's, I'm like, do you really think it's a scam? Do you really think it is? Or is it just because you have so much into a specific product that you cannot see past your horse blinders into another project. And that is the big thing. Uh, and I think that's the problem with Bitcoin maximalists. And I am always uh, very wary about me falling into that trap where I just can't see behind or beyond my horse blinders because I have these positions. So uh, we were talking about this, uh, this specific uh, position, all these different, and he, you know, he or she was talking about how, how they're a scam and whatnot. And uh, it was revealed that this person uh, had been, had, you know, really pumped their bags a long, long time ago for a specific product. And it, it, for some reason, I mean, not, nothing about, you know, you should be, you, you should not, you know, fill your bags if you, if you believe in the project. But I just need people to be aware, and I try to do this as best as possible. And that is that you have to look for the good in certain projects. If they are a total scam, if they are a bit connect, then call them a bit connect. But I need you to really do some research and not just go, it's a scam, it's a scam, it's a scam, it's a scam. It just is, it really doesn't bode well for the whole cryptocurrency digital asset market. My philosophy is this, and when I'm going through CoinGecko, you'll hear me say this. I don't own X. Congratulations to all you X holders. Good job of holding this the whole time or whatever. Um, I was talking about Neo being one of those types of things. So. I am under the belief that uh, when the water rushes into the harbor, all the ships rise, and what's good for one is potentially good for all. So the more um, fantastic we are to build our community, cryptocurrency digital assets, I think the better off we will all be. Uh, there's a lot of eyes in this space right now, and you don't see it, but I see it. I see it everywhere, and they are looking at us, and they are evaluating from all different types. Now. If we can come together and talk about how great certain products are, fantastic. Just if you're going to call something a scam, talk about how it is a scam and then just you know give your, your points. But don't just totally assume something is awful and then go from there. All, All right. right, that's it. So I hope I kind of clarified my position on that. Uh, just so you know, we have a secondary channel called uh, Digital Asset News Clips. I made it for two reasons. First of all, so you didn't have to watch the whole uh, video. You can break it down to clips because time is money, right? And second of all, I did it just to make sure that YouTube doesn't uh, X me out and gets rid of my channel. So this is like our backup. And also what I try to do is every day is I do a Dan Clip exclusive where I answer questions or go over a separate piece. So just as a little incentive uh, to have you go over there and check that out. And I really appreciate it if you could. So, so that's it for today. So thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. Really appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one. Uh, how about?